Now, this question that you have in front of you, Margie, right? Yeah. It is entirely based on uh, IFRS 2. The base is IFRS 2, right? But there are other standards that are discussed as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in the last class, you remember that uh, we discussed basically the scope of IFRS 2, right? Yeah. yeah. And we'll be applying that scope. The application of that scope is uh, in this question, all right? Now I'm starting. I'm 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 reading the question. Part we're doing part A, right? Part A, part one. All right. Now Margie, a public limited company, has entered into several share-related transactions during the period and wishes to obtain advice on how to account for them. Now, whenever you need, or whenever a client, or whenever a question, or an examiner, examining question, basically needs an advice, right? You have to form the tone of your answer should be. Uh, you know, more of, you know, uh, in, a, in a, prof a professional tone, you get it? A professional tone means that you're delivering something with authority. You're delivering your advice, your, your conclusion, your calculation with authority. All right. Because you're the expert over here. Now, yeah. uh, part one says, uh, on 1st May 20x2, Margie granted 500 share appreciation rights, right? We know what share appreciation rights are to its 300 managers. Okay. All of the rights vested on 30th April 20X4, that is of every of two years, but they can be exercised from 1st May 20X4 up to 30th April 20X6, that is two years more after that. So they have the option to excise it, right? At the grant date, the value of each SAR was $10, irrelevant, right? Because uh, why is it irrelevant? SAR because obviously it's it's a it's a cash settled share based payment, and uh, at the fair value the grant date is relevant because obviously the year has not lapsed yet, right? So once the year lapses, once the once the year pass, once the year passes, right? We'll take the value that which which is basically the fair value at the end of the year, right? Because liabilities are to be valued, revalued each year, right? Now, at the ground rate, the value of each SAR was ten dollars, and it was estimated that five percent of the managers would leave during the vesting period. The fair value of each SAR is as follows: so, thirtieth April twenty X three, you have nine dollars. Fine, thirtieth April twenty X four, you have eleven dollars. Thirtieth April twenty X five is twelve dollars. Right? Once it has been vested, right, which is thirtieth April twenty X four, there will be no time value of money. Right? There will be no no time value of money left. So, fair value will become equals to the the value will basically equal to the intrinsic value, right? All of the managers who were expected to leave employment did leave the company as expected before 30 April 20X4. Fine. On 30 April 20X5, 60 managers exercised their options when the intrinsic value of the right was 10.5 and were paid in cash. So that was uh, on 30 April 20X5, right? Margie is confused as to whether to account for the SARs under IFRS 2 or IFRS 13 fair value measurement and would like advice as to how the SARs should have been accounted for between the grant date and 30th April 20X5. Number one. So basically what you need to talk about is that there are two things that you'll talk about, right? From what I understand, right, there's one mark for discussion on IFRS 13, right? If for example, I was, in, I was a student, this is what I would have deduced from the marks allocated. One mark for, I, for, the, for the discussion on IFRS 13, right? And five marks for IFRS 2. So five marks, basically you have your calculations, you have your uh, advice on how to present it in the financial statements. Because obviously it's a cash settled share based payment. You have to appreciate that, right? Liabilities are to be revalued at each year and you have to appreciate that. You have to show the workings as well. You have to show the expense. You have to show the value of the liability at 30th, uh, 30th April 20X5, right? So these are all the factors that will be, you know, catered in this, in these six marks, right? Let's solve the first yeah. scenario, uh, first scenario. All right. And then we'll move on to part two and part three because they're isolated scenarios, right? Okay. Now, in part one, first, 
I'll just quickly do the calculation because where, wherever there is calculation, I prefer that the students do the calculation first, right? So that you're done with one part of it entirely. You you're done with the calculation in, in its entirety, and you move on to the explanation, explanation later on. And obviously, your uh, explanation to some extent will be based on the numbers, right? Because in this case, you have to discuss discuss I five thirteen as well, right? So first, yeah. I'll do the calculation, and then we can move on to the um written fact the explanation right yeah. now liability at 30th april 20 x3 right so we'll do the entire working because we need to show what exactly we left with right uh let's say the the date i'll put down the headings so you have date um you have your calculation do the calculation right and you have your expense you have your cumulative liability cumulative liability right and uh, yeah now date so at 30th april 20x3 i'm treating it as 2003 or 2020x3 only right you have an expense of how much let's see 300 managers right each manager manager gets 500 sars yes right and it said that 5% of the managers would leave during the vesting period so only 95% of the managers will exercise it right ah mm. so, uh, 5% yeah 95% because 5% will leave the company right okay. mm. value of each sar is what Nine. Nine. Right. Now, the vesting period was for two years, right? That means since you're working for the very first year, we'll do one divided by two, right? Now, since this is the first year, this becomes your cumulative liability, and your double entry turns out to be P and L debit and liability. credit right now for the second year so this stays the same right we'll just change the we'll just remove 1 over 2 because now it's 2 over 2 entirely and we'll change the value right the value at uh, 30th april 20x4 is 11 and not 9 right but again this will get me the cumulative figure right this will get me the cumulative figure so i'll just yeah. the difference between this and this will become your expense for the year so the double entry for the second year will be bnl debit and liability credit done uh, so why are you taking the difference because this is expense for the year right the cumulative liability at the start of the year was for we're talking about 30th april 20x4 now right yeah. the cumulative liability at the start of the year was 641250 the cumulative liability at, at the end of the year is 1.56 million right the difference okay. because there is an increase in liability an increase in liability leads to an expense right okay. hmm. now we also have to see uh that uh, on 1325 uh, 60 marriages so can you show me the uh, calculation of uh, cumulative liability of second year yeah 300 into 500 ah, okay, okay. into 95% into 11 all right 11 is a base 11 is basically the fair value now okay. at the start of the next year it said basically i'm reading it again all, all the managers who were i'm reading it from here all right so this is this is where i'm reading from all the managers who were expected to leave employment did leave the company as expected before 30th april 20x4 on 30th april 20x5 60 managers were excised their options that is by the end of the next year when the intrinsic value of the right was 10.5 and were paid in cash all right okay now do you want me to work 
in the statement form or do you want me to make a T account for you? Now, remember, you can do both in your examination, right? In your exam, you can do both. It doesn't matter if you have a paper-based exam or a CB, right? It does not matter. But making it or doing it in a statement form is much easier as compared to a T account. All right. I'll show you both ways, right? You can do whatever you like. Okay. okay. Now, uh, the opening liability was what? Opening liability okay. is basically on 1st May 20x4, right? Was what? What was your opening liability? It's four one two five zero. No, one five six seven five hundred. All right. Get it because this is the closing liability for thirty level twenty x four, right? This becomes the opening liability ah, for the yeah, next yeah. year. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now, some of the individuals exercised the options. All right. So you yeah. paid, you paid off your liability, right? At what value? So that's 60 managers out of 300, right? 60 managers out of 300. Each got 500 worth of uh, SARs, 500 SARs basically. And each SAR was worth 10.5 because at the time of uh, exercising, there's no time value of money in, uh, included, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now the fair value equals the intrinsic value. All right. You basically fair value constitutes of two things, right? It is basically your intrinsic value in uh, your time value of money and your intrinsic value, right? But time value of money is gone now. So this becomes three, one, five. I'll put the minus figure, right? And the closing liability, we will only calculate what we have. All right, we don't need to calculate anything else. The remaining will become your balancing figure, right? So the closing liability, which will be 30th April 20x5, will be what? 240 managers are left, right? Mm -hmm. They haven't excised the shares. I'm sorry, not 240, because you had uh, 300 and 5% five, 5 left, right? So what is it? What is 300 into 95%? So that's 285. So out of 285, 60 exercise, right? So you have uh, what? 225 left, right? 225 managers. Each have 500 share appreciation rights. And the value of each appreciation right is what? 12. Because fair value at the end yeah. of 30th level 20x5 is 12. 12. Mm -hmm. For these 225 managers, fair value still consists of two elements, intrinsic and time value of money. All right. So mm -hmm. that's uh, 225 into what? 500 into 12, right? So that's 1.35 million, right? Let's see if this equals this closing right so one two five two five hundred but the closing liability turns out to be one three five zero so just because there's an increase in the fair value you have an expense arising during the year which is ninety seven thousand five hundred so this is your expense for the year all right yeah now, I'll show you the T account method, right? So this is working with your cumulative liability account, right? Cumulative liability, right? Your balance yeah. brought down from the previous year was one, five, six, seven, five hundred. The amount that you paid because it reduces the liability, liability is to be reduced on the debit side, is T15000. You have your closing liability of 13500, 
right? So your PNL, that is your expense, that means PNL debit and cumulative liability account credit, turns out to be this plus this minus this. All right, ninety-seven thousand five hundred. So this is your T account. Get it? Sure. Yeah. Now you've done all the calculations. Now you put it in. You need to put it into words, right? Yeah. Number one. What will you discuss first? Uh, so one second. Can I uh, actually write down all the calculations? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. My bad, man. Sure. Uh, yeah. Now the first point that you put, right? The first point that you talk about is what? It's IFR is thirteen, right? Does oh. does the transaction in any way come under the scope of IFR is thirteen? No. No. Why? Because IFR is thirteen is only to be referred when a particular standard tells you to refer it for fair value measurement. All right. For example, IS forty, fair value measurement, right? For example, IFR is nine. Right, fair value of financial instruments. Right, these are the standards that refer IFRS 13 for fair value measurement. Right, but IFRS 2 has its own fair value calculations, so it does not refer IFRS 13. All right, these are the things that you need to write down. You need to negate this factor that IFRS 13, this, this transaction does not come under the scope of IFRS 13 fair value measurement. Okay, so you what you'll basically talk about? These are just pointers so that you know exactly how to, uh, you know, bring up the information. That's it. All right. Does not. This is not how you'll write in your exam. You need to make par. You need to make paragraphs. You need to explain in the right manner. Right. I first. So you discuss. Discuss IFRS thirteen scope. And appreciate means that talk about it, right? Appreciate means I need to discuss this. That this transaction does not come under the scope, or is out of scope. Scope of IFRS 13. Done. Next up. Yeah. There's nothing that you have to do. You just have to work out. You just have to explain all the calculations. That's it. All right. Explain the numbers. That's it. You're done with the answer. Okay. How will you explain the uh, explain numbers? We calculated uh, the closing liability. You just need to number one, obviously, need to show the working, right? And then you need to tell them that why did we why did you do this working? Because it's a cash settled share based payment. Number one, right? Cash settled share based payments are going to IFRS two. Are to be revalued at each year end because it's a liability. Liability is to be revalued at each year end, right? You you talked about two things. Number one, cash settled share based payment. Number two, or I'll just Revert. cash settled SBP need to revalue revalue. Sorry, according to fair value at Each year end, right? Because it's a liability, okay. And then you show your workings, and you tell exactly because they've asked us for uh, how the SL should have a should have, should have been account for between the grant date and thirty to twenty x five. 
So this is what you have to show. This is what you have to advise on, right? Mm-hmm. You have to start from the grant date. Obviously, there's no working for the grant date because that's first May 20x2. The, the first year end of the grant date, basically. The first year end of the grant period, which is 30th April 20x3. You show the working and you finally discuss 30th April 20x5, the outstanding liability, outstanding liability at 30th April Twenty uh, X five is what? Sorry, is one point three five? Sorry, one point three five mil. All right. Expense for the year is for the year is. You can either write down. You can you can either write write down the whole figure, or what you can do is you can. Put it down in millions, right? So zero point nine five nine seven five million or ninety seven thousand five hundred, right? Okay. Ninety seven thousand five hundred. So that's zero point zero nine seven five, right? Okay. Now, done. You're yeah. done with this part. All right. You don't have anything else. Second part. Second part says. Margie issued shares during the financial year. Some of those shares were subscribed for by employees who were existing shareholders, and some were issued to an entity, Grief, which owned five percent of Margie's share capital. Before the shares were issued, Margie offered to buy a building from Grief and agreed that the purchase price would be settled by the issue of shares. Margie requires advice. Again, it talks about advice. All right. So Margie, Margie requires advice about how to account for these two transactions. Number one. Now this question, even though the marks, you know, probably the scenario is for what? One, two, three, four, five, six, six lines, say five and a half lines, right? And you you have five marks allocated to it. All you have to do is discuss what transactions fall under the scope of IFRS two. That's it, and apply to the case, right? We discussed it earlier. That if you're if you're getting some goods or services, that is a valid consideration against your issue of shares, or a settlement which is equivalent to the value of shares, right? Only transactions such as these come under the scope of IFRS two. That's it. Nothing else. Nothing else. For five okay. months. Get it? So. Margie issued shares under the financial uh, during the financial. Some of those shares were issued, subscribed by for that. That's obviously it's a new issue. That's why they were subscribed for by employees who are existing shareholders. So technically, this because this is either a f- full rights issue or a you know full price issue or a rights issue. You know, so this is the employees are subscribing for these shares because they're already shareholders, right? They're not giving any valid, or they're not providing any consideration to the, to the company against their sub- subscription of shares. Get it? So such transactions do not, uh, or you can say they're out of scope of IFRS two. Okay. What you need to discuss is that employees subscribing to shares. In the capacity of shareholders, you can say valid consideration, or you can say service. Out of scope of IFRS two. Done. Second part. What about grief? The transaction that I'm doing with grief. Does this does that transaction come under IFRS two? Does it come under IFRS two or not? No. It does. 
because you're receiving a valid consideration which is a good or a service a good is you're receiving a building right you're buying a building you're not paying yeah. in cash you're paying in the settlement is in shares right you're issuing yeah. new shares to it to the to the entity grief right uh, now yeah. again you need to make paragraphs while you're writing the answer this is just uh this is just for explanation right with regards to grief what you can say is that uh, transaction will be recorded as per ifrs 2 because the building because margi is buying a sorry buying a building against the issue of shares number 1 number 2 very important thing and i believe there will be a mark for it what you need to discuss is the valuation at what value will you recognize uh, your equity since the value of the building asset or you can say good being received by the issuing entity which is margi right can be determined therefore determined therefore according to ifrs 2 the value of equity will be equal to the value of the building which is also called the direct measurement method right get it this is where you get your five marks all right now the third part is basically ifrs 9 with ifrs 2 i'll just explain the ifrs 2 part and once we study ifrs 9 okay once we revise our ifrs 9 and start when you start uh, the question with ifrs 9 i'll discuss this part also i'll basically explain how to record the transaction okay margi has entered into a contract with the producer to purchase 350 tons of wheat all right um the purchase price will be settled in cash at an amount equal to the value of 2500 of margi's shares fine margi may settle the contract at any time by paying the producer an amount equal to the current market value of 2500 of margi shares less the market value of 350 tons of wheat so over here you know there's there's a concept called in ifrs 9 right there is a concept called net settlement right this is a case for net settlement all right now and net settlement indicates ifrs 9 derivatives derivative accounting all right now um okay fine margi has no intention of taking physical delivery of wheat again an indication of derivative all right no physical delivery there is no intention of taking physical delivery of wheat the directors of margi are unsure as to whether this transaction is a share based payment and require advice as to how it should be accounted for in the financial statements i'll talk about the first part and the next part that is how it should be accounted for in the financial statements we'll discuss it when we do ifrs 9 okay okay this does not come under ifrs 2 why there's a reason can you tell me the reason why because there is no valid consideration being received how do i know there's no valid consideration because there's an option to settle there's an option to settle on net basis 
all right so there's in fact there's no intention of taking physical delivery right so they, therefore it's on net basis as per ifrs 9 this has uh this has characteristics of a derivative this contract has a uh, this contract has characteristics of a derivative all right and derivatives are to be recorded at each year end that is valued at each year end at fair value through profit and loss so you will basically record fair value any changes in fair value will be taken to profit and loss statement right get it yeah this is just a rough explanation that i'm doing obviously i haven't applied it to the case i have just applied the ifrs2 part to the case that ifrs2 will not be uh, you, you will not uh, you will not record the transaction according to ifrs2 in this case all right so far so good yeah you understand everything yeah all right